here this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about Jesus as King. And, and there's uh, a couple different ways. I've talked about this before, but I think it's just kind of a fun little like thought experiment. Uh, but there's several different ways that someone can become king. Uh, and all my knowledge here is mostly based on, on movies and stuff. Um, but there's several different ways uh, you can become a king. I think the first one uh, is that of like a hereditary claim. All right, the hereditary claim is that your father is king. Uh, if you have the right lineage, uh, you can become uh, a king. And then we saw throughout different European history, uh, you know, some really deformed looking kings because they really wanted to try to keep this in the family and make them as hereditarily pure as possible uh, and start making people look weird. Uh, but when we look at Jesus, we can see that Jesus fits a hereditary claim. We talked about, uh, as we looked in the book of Matthew, that Jesus was the great, 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 great grandson of, that's exactly right, is the grandson of King David, all right? So he has a hereditary claim, not only what would matter through his stepfather, Joseph, that's what would matter, all right? And so he he is in the line of David through Joseph, but he is also genetically through the line of David through Mary. All right, this is something that other religious groups have tried to claim as, as well. There have been different religious groups throughout the ages uh, that have tried to claim this. Um, you know, in France, there was a, uh, an overthrow of, of the French kings called Merovingian kings uh, for a little while. They claimed to be the descendants of Jesus. They said that Jesus had, a, had a, an unknown child through Mary Magdalene and that they are the descendants of of uh, of Jesus again, just totally made up stuff just to bolster your claim because they realized like uh, we we don't have a hereditary claim, so we got to claim a different kind of claim. Uh, Joseph Smith claimed that uh, the last king of Israel, uh, uh, Zedekiah uh, Jehoiachin, uh, had had a son, and that his son escaped the Persian Empire and came to America and bred with Native American tribes, uh, and that now there's two extra tribes of Israel living in America, even though we have seen zero genetic uh, evidence of that, and that they became Mormons. That was, uh, that was their claim. So you see how people they use and abuse hereditary claims, but when we look at Jesus, or he has a hereditary claim to the throne. This, they, you know, Matthew knew this was important, <coughs> and so he showed how this uh, would fit in. He also has a prophetic claim. Now, a prophetic claim would be things like, you know, a sword in the, you know, a sword in the stone. That would be for whoever can pull the sword out of the stone can become the, the king of England. Uh, we have seen other, like it's usually not in giant, you know, European kingdoms, uh, but you will see in a lot of tribal communities they will have little. Uh, promises like if you're the seventh son of a seventh son, or if you're born on a certain day during a blood moon, during a this, that many tribal groups will have prophetic claims that if a child is ever born like this, all right, then you know they will rule. We see this even to this day in India. We'll see little uh, tribes uh, in, in the countryside. A child is born with you know, an extra a thumb or a little tail or something like that. And then they're like, oh, this is an avatar of one of these gods. And they're kind of elevated in this, you know, prophetic leadership. All right, Jesus certainly fits a prophetic claim. All right, he has over 300 different prophecies about him that we'll look at a couple of names. Uh, the idea of being born of a virgin, being born in Bethlehem, moving to Egypt, riding on Jerusalem on a donkey, crucified with no bones being broken, uh, a soldier gambling for his clothes and rising from the dead, are just you know seven of the claims that Jesus fulfills. So he fulfills a prophetic claim. Now, when we say political claim, we tend to think of it today in terms of like voting. And uh, that's a relatively new phenomenon. Not, I mean, it's still we still saw this throughout the ages. Uh, but how people make a political claim is they claim to be the best at something. They either claim to be the best strategist, all right. They claim to be the, the smartest, all right. They claim to be the strongest. We look at the first king of Israel, Saul. He was chosen because he was taller than everyone else. That's the only kind of description we see of him. 
as they got together in the different tribes, they picked the tallest person in the kingdom because that's who you want when you go have someone go negotiating in times of war it's nice to have someone big and strong and giant out there it kind of makes you feel like oh yeah i'm with him all right so a political claim so does jesus have some sort of political claim well of course he does he is the best at everything all right whatever jesus is he the fastest sure he can teleport can he jump the highest yeah he can fly all right like jesus can do anything. He is, if, if there was a bachelor shot style show, I'm sure he would win that too. He'd get the rose at the end of that. He loves the whole world. Like everybody, he would win no matter the claim. He is the greatest of all time. And we see that, you know, from the very get go, we'll even see here in the book of Luke that he is a man. And that is a huge emphasis in the book of Luke, but it doesn't neglect that he is God, that he is capable of anything. If we were to have a ruler, we would want someone that is the best at everything. That's what our political process is, I guess, hypothetically supposed to do here in America, give us the best representatives to represent our communities and our state and our country. It does not seem to work out that way, for whatever reason. Something, something's broken somewhere. Uh, we don't seem to be getting the best. But we, in our ideal world, like, yeah, wouldn't we want the, the wisest person running a country? That makes sense. That's Jesus. That is, gee, there is not going to be a single uh, qualifier that we could come up with that says we would want the best this to run the world. That would be better Jesus. All right, Jesus fulfills that political claim. What about a financial claim? So there are what would happen very, you know, commonly through kind of uh, medieval Europe is that if a king was going to war and they, they wanted to, you know, they needed to like raise money on them. Many times they would sell a portion of their kingdoms to some other, you know, lord of some sort that would then, you know, declare themselves king of their own country. So you could literally buy a country. All right, you could literally buy a piece of land. Like there's little, there's little tiny countries in Europe that like you don't even realize are countries uh, because, you know, there are a couple square miles but, you know, there's a castle there, someone bought it back in the 1300s, and they declared themselves king of, you know, you know, Catalonia, you know, they, they made themselves a little area of steel, like there's these little tiny little micronations all over Europe because someone came along, bought it, declared themselves king. Uh, even today, there's like popular little things that you can buy a little one foot by one foot square of land in Scotland, you know, and, and call yourself a lord or a lady. Uh, I saw a couple of different news stories that, you know, people were buying little pieces of land in the Sahara Desert, you know, for their daughter so that they could be the princess of, you know, Sudan land. And yeah, that's that's going to go well in life. You know, when your daughter was like, yes, you are a princess, literally, I will, I will buy you a piece of land to make you a princess. You know, so you can do that. Like you can, through finances, buy a country, you can buy an election. That works too. All right. So you can, uh, you can literally, like this is a way to become a king. So does Jesus have a financial claim? Well, of course he does. All right. He has not only am I saying like only the cattle on a thousand hills. What he is, he has the most precious commodity in the world. His blood, when it was shed gave people an opportunity at eternal life. I mean, we see, you know, we have seen countries spend millions and billions of dollars, you know, throughout the, you know, 14, 15, 1600s looking for, you know, the new world, and looking for El Dorado, and looking for the lost city of Z, and looking for these goals, and they're looking for the fountain of youth, and they're, you know, DeSoto's hiking around the swamps of Tampa, you know, looking for, you know, looking for this fountain of youth because we understand the most precious thing is time. If somebody actually came up with, a fountain of youth that you could live forever, there's no amount of money that you can limit that to. That would be the most valuable thing in the universe. And here's Jesus coming along, sheds his blood, and gives people eternal life. It is the most valuable thing in the history of the universe forever and ever. There is no comparison. So he does have a financial claim, and his financial claim is on the eternal kingdom of God. And the last one's a military claim. And I think we can see this. This is how you know most coups go on. I don't know if you're following the news at all with this last uh, Brazil election, but it was very, very close 
Uh, you know, uh, we're talking like, you know, in popular depending if it was you know, a few point percentage points difference in a new, you know, there's a new uh, president down there in Brazil, and there was a real possibility that the uh, that the military was going to side with the losing side and simply just march on the city and say, no, the election was fraud and just kind of take over the country. Like when uh, an entire military, if the military is strong enough, it can march in and say, I'm leader. Now what's stopping, you know, what happens to these military coups is like, okay, actually I'm in charge right now. I'm in charge. I mean, we've seen this throughout history in Cuba, Nicaragua, and all kinds of time. If you have the biggest army, you can make a military claim on your nation. All right, so now when we look at Jesus, this was the expectation that many Jewish people had of the Messiah coming in, that he is going to make his military claim now, that he is going to take his military, he is going to rise up the people of Israel, and they are going to, you know, expel the foreign invaders and the Romans, and then clearly throughout his life, death, burial, and resurrection, we do not see Jesus make a military claim yet. Right, that is what we're going to look at here in a couple of weeks. Just a reminder, we're going to be uh, uh, having a Christmas Eve service. We'll do uh, 6 o'clock. Did you say 6 o'clock, 6.30? I thought I put that down. 6.30. Do you prefer 6.30? 6.30. Uh, I'll put that down. 6.30. Uh, on uh, Saturday the 24th, and then in the morning on Saturday the 25th, we're going to have a video uh, that we will play uh, in the morning, and you can enjoy that. Uh, from your from your home. Uh, on on that Christmas Eve, we're going to talk about Jesus's military claim. We're going to talk about his return and that he is going to uh, grab this last claim of kingship. But let's look at Luke chapter one here this morning and how Luke introduces uh, Jesus is that he introduces him as the human king. He introduces him as the king that is worthy of all humanity to follow. That when we talk about him being the king of kings and the lord of lords, Jesus is not saying there aren't other kings on this earth. And he's not saying you don't need to follow the instructions and rules and laws of the human, the other kings here on this earth. But that Jesus is the king above all other kings. All right, when it gives the genealogy in the book of Luke, it's easy to notice that there are some differences from Matthew's genealogy to Luke's genealogy. Because Luke, uh, the easiest one to notice is that Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. All right? It lines up the descendants back to Adam to show that you know, Jesus is making a claim to be the best representative of mankind. But we're going to specifically look at Luke chapter 1, the beginning of verse 30. This is uh, uh, very early on in, the, in this story of uh, the book of Luke, where we've been introduced to uh, John and his parents, and now there is this introduction of the angel interacting with Mary. All right, And he appears to her out of nowhere, all right? and she is frightened, normal response to have. Uh, she is probably about a 14-year-old girl. She is betrothed to be married. That would be a pretty normal time frame. Uh, to a man named Joseph, and now here this angel appears before her and says, Do not be afraid, Mary. And see, she's cowering in fear, the normal reaction to seeing an angel. For you have found favor with God. The same idea of uh, when you know God is telling Abraham that there is, you're going to bless the whole earth, this blessing. Same idea here of you found favor. You have been found to be blessed by God. All right, that he is going to bless you, and then ultimately we know that Jesus is going to bless the whole earth. But this is not a punishment. This is a blessing that you get to be the one uh, that brings the Messiah into the world. You have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. So the idea, like this is where, you know, the story, this is what we call the incarnation incarnation is God becoming a man. So God doesn't appear in the form of a man, make him look like he's human. God does not just arrive on the scene. Does God have the capability to literally create a real human body to, you know, to uh, appear and manifest himself? 
yeah, God can do anything. That's that's an easy that's an easy thing. Uh, it's not a hard thing. This is something that uh, both you know Muslim theologians and Jewish theologians try to argue against. That yeah, but God isn't human. God can't be human. And you know my response when I get any kind of reaction like that is like, pause a second. Are you saying God is incapable? Of becoming a human being, that God can do anything in the whole world, can do anything, can make a universe. But when it's like, ah, I want to become a, I want to become a human being, but I just can't. I'm not powerful enough to do this. They're like, well, no. Just say he wouldn't. I'm like, okay. So there's a big difference between he can't and he won't. You're saying he won't. Why won't he? All right. And it can be just a misunderstanding of what is God's purpose. If God's purpose and plan is to save mankind. If his purpose and plan is to be the savior of the world, then we can begin to see, well, I guess under certain circumstances, maybe God would become a human being. And it's important that Jesus is conceived as a human being. Because what God is coming to do here is to redeem mankind. And this starts when you become a human being at conception. All right? You you are not, he is not just born. She could have very easily been like, Here's a baby. Whoa! Like that. If that was the story, we wouldn't question it. Like if the story was, you are gonna have a child. What do you mean? Look, they're in the thicket. This is a baby. Like, oh wow. Like that could have been the story. She's like a little coming in a little basket, like Moses. All right. Like that. We that would we that would be the story. That would be celebrated at Christmas. We'd have little baskets below, you know, in case little baby Jesus arrives. And like we would build out little mythology because it would be. What happened? Uh, but that's not what occurred. He says, no, no, he is coming to redeem all mankind. And it starts when a human being starts, at conception. All right, and here he is going to grow to being a little, a size of a zygote. All right, and he is going to grow into a little bean. He's going to grow into, uh, what do we got, a corn cob now? Is that where we're at? All right, so a little, little baby herc is a corn cob now. All right, so he's going to grow into a corn cob. All right, he's going to grow into, I think, butternut squash is next. I think that's the next fruit or vegetable on the baby growth scale. All right, so, like, he's going to grow into that, and he is going to be born. All right, into this world, he's going to take his first breath. He's going to be a, not a terrible, Jesus didn't have terrible two, terrific twos. All right, he, he's going to be a, a respectful teenager. That's weird, right, kids? You know? Right, <laughs> like, I'm trying to figure what that means. All right, so he's he's going to like grow in all aspects of human life. He is going to grow, and he's going to be the perfect version of that. He is going to be never kept his mom on the inside, just a little like, hey, let me, let me just give you a little massage. All right, like 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 Jesus was the best little piece. All right, so nice to his mom. Let her sleep all night long. He was perfect, the perfect fetus. On right, every stage of life, some of that I'm like I'm guessing at. Uh, I'm like, Where is, is that verse 34? I don't see that. I'm like, that's oh, right. Uh, but Jesus is conceived from the get go. He is going to grow through humanity. All right, she is going to bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. You shall name him Jesus, and this is the name Joshua. Uh, would probably be the more accurate translation that, you know, when the English Bible started writing, they didn't want to, you know, confuse the dumb masses and think that, wait, oh, is Joshua come back from the dead? Like, no, they wanted to create a unique name for Jesus. Jesus is very much just a made-up name for Yesu. It would be Joshua, uh, but they wanted to create a unique name for the Messiah. I got no problem. The idea of the name of God is every culture calls him something different. Some people call him Jesus. Some people call him Isa. Some people call him Jesus. Some people call him Joshua. Some people call him Yeshua. All right, the name is the matters is his reputation, who he is. And you shall name him. He saves. All right, that's what the name Joshua means. He saves. All right, and so that is going to make sense. For he will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. All right, so not only is he going to be human. You're going to conceive in your womb, bear a son. Every which way to communicate that this is a human being. All right, but he will be called the Son of the Most High. He will be the Son of God, and he will be given the throne of his father David. This actually, as we look back in time, the very first prophecy about Jesus 
The very first prophecy of the Messiah, we call this the Proto-Evangelium. It's in Genesis chapter 3. It's the first time we see any kind of mention of the Messiah, any kind of mention of the gospel. All right? and, it, and that's what we call the Proto-Evangelium. It's so basic. It's, big, it's barely there. All right? But as God is condemning Adam and Eve for their sin, he says, I will, he's talking to he's condemning Satan, he's condemning uh, Adam and Eve. He says, I will put enmity between you, serpent, Satan, devil. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. All right, and so what he's saying here, like your, you know, you know, not that Satan has actual like offspring, also, but like your children, your demonic creatures, all right, and her offspring, you know, demon creatures, humans. Um, these little baby, her offspring, and your offspring, he shall bruise your head. All right, when you bruise him, this is a curb stomp. He's gonna curb stomp you. All right, boom, teeth on the curb, boom, right to the back of the head. You shall bruise his heel. You're gonna hurt him. Uh, bruise heel, Sicily. Got you, bruise foot. You're gonna be fine. You're gonna make it. bruised heads. Not gonna make it. Bruised feet. You're gonna make it. Uh, and so he. And this has gotta sound so strange to one of the most powerful beings in the universe. Satan. I mean, I hope he got at this point. I mean, understanding Satan's motives is, is difficult. But God, other level. But we might say, it's a distant second. It's a distant second, no doubt. But we're probably saying that Satan is the second most powerful being in the universe. And Satan is looking at humans and their frailties and their weaknesses and their little soft organs. And he's saying, what? You're saying there is going to be a human that's going to be able to defeat me? Like, I understand I lost today. I lost today between you. I made a huge mistake going against you, God. But you're saying a human's going to beat me? I don't think they had any concept that God was going to say, I'm going to become a human being. I am going to send my one and only son to become a human being. Right? And so the very first prophecy in the scripture that mentions a defeat of the devil, a defeat of sin, a defeat of evil, is that a human is going to one day defeat evil. Right? As we fast forward, there's some, we've already looked at many other prophecies of uh, Abraham and David. Uh, some that we haven't looked at as Isaiah comes along. We really get the first mention in Isaiah that Jesus is going to be God. That Messiah is going to be divine. Up to that point, we saw that, there was going to, that he was going to be in the, the line of Abraham. That we thought he was going to be Jewish. Oh, so, you know, Israelite through the line of, you know, Isaac and Jacob, that he's going to be a Jew through the line of Judah. He's going to be king through the line of David. But these are all human prophecies. And now in Isaiah, we finally start getting divine prophecies. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. El God, all right, God with us, all right, the idea of Emmanuel, so, you know, we'd be like, why did they call his name Emmanuel? They probably thought his name was going to be Emmanuel, but it was just a description of who he was going to be, that he is going to be God with mankind. Now, this word for virgin here, there was obviously a lot of discussion, they, they thought it simply just meant young woman, where this is the word in the Old Testament they would use for virgin, but it can also mean young woman. But don't get confused. When we look in the first, uh, when we look at Luke chapter 1, when it introduces Mary there, I think verse 29 or 28, it refers to her as a virgin, betrothed to be married. That word in the Greek for virgin is much clearer, and it doesn't mean young woman. It means virgin. That is not laid with a man. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These are all names that we would use for the different persons of the Trinity. These are 
You know, we would tend to say wonderful counselor, probably more descriptive of the Holy Spirit. We would tend to say, you know, everlasting father is more descriptive of the father. We tend to say Prince of Peace is more descriptive of God the Son. Uh, but it's showing that they're all mighty God. Uh, but that this is who the Messiah is going to be, is God. The increase of the government and peace, there will be no end. The throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and hold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forever more. It's another prophecy of the line of David lasting forever. So scripture is trying to communicate two things. That Jesus is human. And that's It takes time in the book of Luke. None of the other Matthew and Mark and John don't take any time to really go through the ins and outs of Jesus' birth. Here's Luke, a doctor, that is like, yeah, I'm actually going to make sure it's crystal clear that Jesus is human. In fact, in the early church, there was more confusion in the early church about Jesus' humanity than it is his divinity. The reason why we connect with the book of John so much and we love the book of John is that the struggles in our community in America is that Jesus is God. You know, we don't deal with a lot of people arguing that Jesus isn't human. That's what people argue. Like, he's human, but he's just human. And we have to be ready with all the examples in scripture and theories and, like, you know, of course he's human. But he's also divine. He is God. He is the Son of God. We have to build these arguments and we have to be good at that. But the early church and the Jewish community especially were not struggling that Jesus was God. He did all sorts of miracles. Uh, he rose from the dead. Everybody in the semi-Christian community knew that Jesus was God. They struggled with, was Jesus really human? And it was partly because it was this very common uh, belief called Gnosticism that it infected the Jewish community and the church uh, at, you know, at the same time. That they believed that the physical world was evil. And that makes sense to us. Like, yeah, yeah, spiritual world, good, physical world, evil. But that's actually not true. When God created the world, he created it good. When he said that, you know, the light was good and the land was good and the animals were good and humans were very good. So in the beginning, when God created it, when God created the world, he didn't say it was bad. Why would God do something bad? He, it's good. And now we see that it has fallen. We have turned everything bad. Everything humans touch now because of our sin goes bad. Here comes Jesus saying, I'm going to fix it. And he starts with the human soul. And he says, I'm going to fix it and make it good again. And now he's going to work on the rest. And that's ultimately he's going to fix the rest of this world, the rest of the universe, ultimately creating a new heaven and a new earth. All right, but Jesus is coming to fix the physical world all right, and make it good again. So the early struggles, Luke was answering something that they didn't know was going to be a major problem yet, that there was a fight over his humanity, his humanity. So when we talk about God, we talk about Jesus, that he is both God and man. We don't want to say that, oh, yeah, he's kind of God. He's human on the outside and God on the inside. That's not how we... The, the early church fathers, and that's certainly not how scripture talks about Jesus. It's weird to say, but does Jesus have a human soul? Well, of course, he's human. Of course he has a human soul. Like, whatever a human soul is, Jesus had. <laughs> Jesus had that. It, does that mean that Jesus is not God? Of course not. Jesus is God. What about Jesus' being is not God? Anything, if there was some kind of little genetic test that we could do and like take a finger, pull out, put put it in a little petri dish, grow, if there was a test that we could do to be like, is Jesus God? It would be, it would turn green, we get a little plus sign, whatever. But Jesus is God. Whatever God is in substance, that's what Jesus is. Whatever a human is, that's what Jesus. Jesus is human and he is divine. This is what he is. And he is good, and he is finally bringing good to the rest of humanity. He is humanity's king because he is the best of us. He needs nothing for himself. He gives everything to us. And this is the important thing to fast forward to the cross. It is vital that Jesus is human. As he earns all the grace that we couldn't earn for ourselves. Everything that we could not do on our own, we are digging a hole, and all we can do is dig that hole deeper. Here comes this 
perfect human being, Jesus, dying on the cross for our sins. Because he is God, he is able to take the wrath of God. He is able to pay for all humanity's sins, something no other individual human being could do. But because he is God, he is capable of anything. And because he is human, he is able to share the effects of grace and what he earned on the cross <coughs> with other human beings. Now, we talked about this a little bit more last year at Christmas uh, and kind of debunking a lot of this stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of skeptics that like to look at Jesus and say, oh, he is just another in a long line of um, you know, demigods like that, that Hercules is like that, you know, and Osiris is like that. All right, all these kind of half God, half man coming to defeat, you know, you know, evil, sin, bad, whatever. Uh, and, and I say, no, I think we're there's a lot of misinformation out there of people like changing their story to fit, make it fit more like Jesus. But I still say, like, I think there is a chance that God could have put this little this little inkling in these artists' mind throughout history, writing this this yearning that people have for a savior, this yearning of, yeah, maybe if humans messed up so much, maybe God would have to come and fix it. Maybe the, the problem is too big for humans to fix that will take a God to come and fix this. And there could be that potential that God put that in. And then it makes sense that in, in, there's uh, little archetypes that people write about. You know, we call you know the story of you know Christmas and the Bible the greatest story ever told because we see those little tropes throughout you know literary history. We, we see Frodo, we see Superman, we see Neo, we see these characters come out, and it's the same, the hero's journey. That there is this, you know, like, what is this hero going to do to save people uh, that don't deserve saving? All right? Uh, in the early time, I like using Superman as an example. You know, early on in Superman mythology, uh, you know, they made sure that there was a lot of links to Jesus when the two guys that wrote it were both Jewish, ironically. Uh, uh, that wrote the early Superman comic books. But Superman's mother uh, and father were named Mary and Joseph Kent. And they thought that was a little too on the nose, so they changed it after the first couple of issues. You know, when we know his real name is Kal L, L being the name from God. But just listen to this. This is the early trailer for Man of Steel. Just listen to the dialogue. And this is dialogue that they recorded for Marlon Brando in the first one, but they didn't end up using. Because again, they thought it was a little too on the nose. As a human being, you are not what they are. Babylon, Greece, and Rome, uh, and Roman and DC cultures, you see these dying and rising gods. But, you know, is it just another story? And I would say, no, like Jesus comes about in the fullness of time, the way the Galatians puts it. And he comes at a time in history where the Romans have built these roads all over the world, and they, there's this united language because of the Greek Empire that the known world can be reached in one language. Like the arrival of Jesus came at this perfect time for it to spread throughout history, throughout cultures, throughout communities. All right? And what people had heard in myths, and this is why we see Christianity spread so quickly in that first century, uh, there were some estimates that about 25% of the earth had trusted Christ in that first century. 
Um, and that uh, the reason why it did that is what you maybe have heard of, you know, Cyrus, and you heard of Hercules. You can go and visit people in Jerusalem and saw Jesus face to face. This is what made it different. You never met anybody that ever, you don't even know like, a, you know, your friends, neighbors, cousins that met Hercules. Because it was a time, a long time ago, in the land of myth and legend. Like, it was, it, it, nobody, of course nobody knew him, but people knew Jesus. And when the gospel is spreading in that first century, people are still alive that saw Jesus. The people that were spreading the gospel were people that like, you know, I saw him. You mean you know someone that saw him? Like, no, I saw him. My name is John. My name is Peter. Like, I saw this stuff with my own eyes. All right? And this is what spread the gospel so, so quickly. So what do we do with this information that Jesus is the human king? All right? The first piece of application is there, there should be a respectful language that comes in part. Whenever we see people interacting with a king. It's always, you know, my liege, my highness, your majesty, your excellency. So the question is, how do we talk about Jesus? Jesus gives us no commands in the way in which we are to speak to him, in which we are to address him. All right? And in many ways, we are to address him as a friend. I do think sometimes we have gone too far, all right, in that we, you know, we kind of talk about him as like, you know, Jesus is my homeboy. Uh, but, and I think in other times we, like, we maybe go too far in the other direction that we, we make him like such a distant being that, you know, we just kind of talk to him in fanciful language and prayers and we're not actually thinking about talking to someone who is actually listening to us. Uh, there's a clip that, um, the Kings of Comedy did, uh, a couple years ago, Steve Harvey, uh, was asked, he was doing like a little Q&A before showing he asked, this is, it was impromptu, he was asked uh, who would he want to introduce, is there anybody that like, he would like, because he was like the hype man, he would like introduce each, you know, the different King of Comedy people, and he was like, well there's one person I want to, it would be Jesus, and he says, I don't know, I'm doing it all right, I'm sure people would do it differently, this is just how I would do it, so this is how he said he would introduce Jesus, if he ever had the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce a man who needs no introduction. His credits are too long to list. He has done the impossible time after time. He had, out of a manger in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, by way of heaven. I don't think 
we always think about the way we talk about Jesus, but I think people should be able to tell in the way we talk about him how we actually feel. I don't know Steve Harvey well enough. I don't know. I'm not going to be standing up like, yep, there, there's a guy that really believes in Jesus. I feel like there's this there's emotion at the end there. Like, doesn't mean nothing to him. Something, God got a hold of him in some way. And I think the way we talk about Jesus, there, there should be just something in, in, in our talk. It doesn't always have to be in the exact words we say, but how we say them, that would show the respect that we have for Jesus. I think the, simple, the second thing would be the idea of like humble acts. You know, that you know, when a king comes by, there's, you know, people bow and people curtsy and people, you know, kiss the ring. I mean, maybe that's just God popping. But the, there is this humbling act that you're supposed to do in the presence uh, of a king. Now, we talked about this last week, that he wants us to serve others the way that he served others. So, again, as we said, there's no command in Scripture to, uh, you know, like how we talk about Jesus. And that, you, yeah, you better use these words before you talk to me, son. The same way there isn't any acts that we're supposed to do, like the things that we've talked about, like close your eyes and bow your heads, that, that's kind of, we invented that to just keep kids quiet while we pray. Like, there isn't certain things that God has demanded of us that before you talk to me, you better do this. You better, like, do this in this way, because I think he, he does do that, just not in the spot we would think. He says, I want you to treat others the way you would treat me. So, like, when he, when he says, like, hey, I was hungry and you fed me, I was in prison and you visited me, I was poor and you brought me food, uh, you, you know, you, I, you, I needed you and you brought me gift cards from Wawa. Like, when we do things and serve God's people, he says, that is the humbling act I'm looking for. That I'm looking for you and whatever station you are at to act towards those in a lower station in a way of humility. Because that is what Jesus did. Here's the God of the universe that was born in a feeding trough. You know, here is the God of the universe that if Jesus was born, but at least we now get, like, Jesus wasn't born in the best place that he was like, if I gotta go to Earth, I mean, please give me some AC. All right? And he was saying, no, I'm gonna go to Earth. And I'm gonna be born where everybody's gonna recognize, oh, that's that's some humble beginnings. Like, Nazareth, <coughs> that's where he grows up. He's born in Bethlehem, in a stable, around animals, in a, you know, in a manger. Right, like in a feeding truck, like he is clearly lived a humble life. And it, the key is, he says, I, it's not just because, all right, I want you to live like I live. He says, I want you to serve others and act humbly around others the way I acted humbly before them. I think we maybe all had bosses at different times that <coughs> when, uh, you know, when they were, when their boss, like the middle manager kind of person, when their boss, when the CEO, when the president was around, they're all nice and friendly, and right when they get away at home, so they treat everybody like jerks again. All right? And the answer is Jesus is like, I see everything. All right? And what I don't want you to do is, in my presence, act all kind and humble, and, you know, at church, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm so humble. But then right when you're kind of out of this place, treat everybody like jerks. He's like, no, no, no. I want you to treat everyone like you be a servant to everyone. And lastly, there's this like complete obedience. Like when you have a king, it's you know the reason why the you know the American uh, colonists didn't want a king. They didn't want to exchange one king for another king. They wanted something different because they understand what it means to have a king. That there's complete obedience. When they say pay taxes, you pay taxes, and there's nothing you can do about it. When they say join my army, you join the army because there's nothing you can do about it. When they say build my palace, you build the palace because there's nothing you can do about it. Like when you have a king, you they, they basically kill you if you don't want to do what you want. And so the question is, should there be complete obedience to Jesus? The answer is, of course we should. Now the difference is Jesus doesn't uh, do anything based on threats. Jesus isn't saying, if you don't obey me, I will turn you into a frog. You know, like, if you don't obey me, I am going to, like, you know, melt you down to your DNA. 
Like, Jesus doesn't do that. He, he says, listen, I have a voluntary army. I have a voluntary workforce. I have people voluntarily give all they have to build my kingdom. Jesus gave us everything up front. And again, like, <coughs> terrible, terrible business practice. If he was a businessman, he'd be a terrible one. Right? Where it's like, hey, you know, you we would expect, like, here, we're going to put a little down payment down. Like, here's, I'm going to give you some happiness in life. But if you want eternal life, oh, yeah, that's at least 50 years of service. All right? And then when you do your 50 years of service, I give you a little gold roll like you can go ahead. Uh, he, he doesn't dangle his eternal promises before us. He gives it all. And he says, here you go. Here is the Holy Spirit. This is the down payment that will remind you that your eternal kingdom is in promised in time. Uh, here is everything, <laughs> eternal life, my presence, my love, uh, my grace. You get it all in full. And then he says, now I want you to build my kingdom. No threats. It's voluntary. Mm -hmm. I want you to spend your time to build my kingdom. Uh, and if we really see Jesus as king, if we say that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and we mean that, I think all these things got to fall into place. The way we talk about them, the way we act around the people, the way we serve them, should all be reflective that we do have a king and we are happy to have that king. Let's pray. Jesus, um, I, believe, I believe that you are the king of all kings. You are the one that I wish was ruling everything here on this earth. I wish you ran everything uh, in our lives because you would certainly do better than any other politician and you would even certainly do better than me. You would do better than me in running my life. You would do better than me in running everything that I do in my life and I want to follow you, trust you, listen to you, obey you. I want others to know that you are worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. You are worthy of uh, all um, the accolades we can give your way, and yet you turn all that and say, okay, if you love me, love one another. If you would serve me, serve one another. And so, God, we want to live that out as best we know how. Build your kingdom in the best way we know how. Follow what you say in your word, but whatever we think, like, okay, I know God wants me to do this. Let us be faithful to you, Jesus, in whatever way we know. Let us tell others of your greatness, of your goodness, of your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.